Welcome to this week's Emmaus service, live from the New Room in Bristol. My name is Howard Wilson, and I'm the Regional Learning and Development Coordinator for the Learning Network of the Methodist Church in the South West. Quite a mouthful. Welcome to everybody joining in, wherever you're from, wherever you are in the world. Please do leave a comment uh, to say hello, let us know where you are and to where, you, where you're coming from. And the aim of this service is to provide a space where we can gather and know that God walks with us, especially at the most difficult of times. For those watching remotely, the liturgy will be on the screen, and please join in with the words in the bold type. Near and far, God is with us. At this time and in this moment, we stop and take a breath, we watch and we wait for glimpses of God and signs of the kingdom. Breathing in, we become conscious of God's presence with us, Father, Son and Spirit. Breathing out, we let go of what may be worrying us, the news which is causing us stress, the tension which knots our muscles. Breathing in, we ask for forgiveness for the known and unknown ways in which we have caused others harm. Breathing out, the grace of God comes close to help us think, speak and act in new and loving ways. We thank and praise you, God. Looking around us, we give thanks for what surrounds us, a beautiful yet fragile world. Looking beyond us, we give thanks for the communities to which we belong, remembering the new room, its staff, and its volunteers, and all it means to so many people. Looking beside us, we give thanks for those particular people who encourage us, friends, family, and even strangers who we may never meet in person, but connect with online. Loving God, you speak to us in so many ways. As we read and reflect on the words of the Bible today, may your spirit inspire us once again. Amen. Our Bible reading is from Mark Matthew's Gospel. It's the appointed reading for today in the Common Lectionary. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19, and it's Peter's declaration about Jesus. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a story told that Jesus returned to have a quick check on his church, and meeting a group of Christians, Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? 
And they replied, you are the eschatological manifestation of the ground of our being, the charisma within which we find the ultimate meaning of our interpersonal relationships. And Jesus said, you what? You know, I worry sometimes that we have overcomplicated the gospel. We've built up language to express our beliefs that is impermeable, impenetrable to those outside the church and to those within it on many occasions. Like so many human institutions, despite starting with honourable intentions, this language has been used to control the masses and to protect those in power. In that respect, it serves to support Karl Marx in his assertion that religion is nothing more than flowers hiding the chains of our enslavement. Of course, I believe he misunderstood. The abuse of religion may have attempted to hide the chains of exploitation in the past, but that same religion, the religion of the Wesleys, has worked steadfastly to expose the chains and to challenge them and to cut them. Remember, there are flowers and plants that are strong enough to break through any barrier. The opiate of the people has given them the strength to change things. Hence the involvement of the Methodist Church in trade unionism, in the movement to abolish slavery, in challenging discrimination, in promoting safeguarding. If someone were to ask us, what does the Methodist Church stand for? Who are we? I wonder how we might answer. If you were to go upstairs in this building to the museum, you would see an attempt to answer how Wesley might have answered that question in the form of a manifesto. The Methodists seek to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, to seek to ensure full employment, to introduce measures to help the poorest, including a living wage, offer the best possible education, empower individuals to feel they can make a difference, to promote tolerance, to promote equal treatment for women, create a society based on values and, on, and not on profits and consumerism, to end all forms of enslavement, to avoid engaging in wars to avoid narrow self-interest and promote a worldview that cares for animals with whom we share our planet. While it's difficult to argue against any of these statements, there would be Methodist and Christian people who would interpret each in different ways and yet still be sure that they were seeking to do God's will. We must sometimes live with contrary convictions on many topics. As we meet here in the new room and watch our screens at home, the Conference of the Methodist Church is meeting, some of them physically at the National Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham, others joining them virtually online. There are a number of issues that will be seen by some as contentious, there are decisions to be made that will change the nature of our church. Others will reinforce and restate our key principles, like the ideas that our ministers are itinerant, constantly on the move. But at the heart of it, the critical message must be that we are still one church, able to live with contrary convictions, but united in our overarching belief that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of God, sent to bring his people back into a right relationship with God. And upon that solid rock and that solid belief is built God's church, and nothing can or will prevail against it. Amen. So we bring our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. As we come before you, Lord, 
We bring our prayers, we bring our concerns and our worries, our hopes and our dreams. We bring before you the people called Methodists. In particular, we pray for those meeting as the conference of the Methodist Church, both those meeting in Birmingham and those meeting online. We pray for our president, the Reverend Sonia Hick, and the Vice President, Barbara Easton, as they begin their presidential year by overseeing the conference. We pray for Reverend Jonathan Hustler and Reverend Ruth G as Secretary and Assistant Secretary as they seek to serve the will of the conference. And we pray for all members of the team that make it possible for the conference to happen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are ordained to ministry in the church, remembering particularly the Reverend Lee Maydew, who is stationed in this circuit, and the Reverend Rachel Leather, stationed in the Gloucestershire circuit, both within this district. They've both been ordained this weekend, and we pray that the anointing of your spirit fall upon them and enrich the service of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all who are willing to serve you and your church through the work of the conference and through the work of the wider church and pray that your will be done in the decisions that they make this week. We remember in particular the discussion and voting on human relationships and sexuality. We acknowledge the strong feelings on all sides of the debate. We recognise there are those who are hurting and pray that you enfold them in your arms of love and help them to see each other as siblings, not enemies, each seeking to serve you in good conscience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves, and our city, and our world. For all in need, and all capable of addressing that need. That they might be brought together. For those who are ill, and those who can heal. That they may find support in each other. For those of all political parties, that they might put aside politics and work for the betterment of the city, of the country, of the world. In the silence we bring our own needs to you, knowing that as a loving parent you want only what is best for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And so we say together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of love, God of comfort, God of adventure, God of covenant. As we search for hope, may the Spirit show us where it may be found. As we search for connection, may the Spirit prompt us to speak and to act. As we search for meaning, may the Spirit show us what is real in familiar and new places. Help us to look. Help us to really look. Help us to listen. Help us to really listen. We look for God at work in the world 
and pray for healing in the broken places and justice in the hurting places. We thank you that nothing can separate us from the love found through the life, death and resurrection of your son Jesus. Thank you that your strength enables us to work with courage, compassion and hope. And so we are renewed for our journey as we share in a final blessing prayer. We go in peace and connect with the world around us. We go in hope and are not afraid to tell of how things can be different. We go in love and know that as we go, we are surrounded by the unending and everlasting love and care of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.